Welcome to Military Faith and Spiritual Resilience. This is Elizabeth Fulgaro. With me today is Erin Nichols, nutritional and fitness coach and Gold Star Wife. Hello, Erin. Hey, Elizabeth. Thank you for continuing your story with us today. You know, you were sharing some of the ways that you've been growing in your faith and some of the spiritual disciplines that you picked up along the way as we finish our last episode, or ones actually that you intentionally chose. Where was Sam in his faith and his relationship with God? It was an interesting process because as I grew up Catholic, he grew up Lutheran. He, you know, kind of got taken to church. Uh, it certainly wasn't where he wanted to be. Before he got injured, I can, it's funny, I can remember exactly where we were. We were on Oceanside Boulevard in, the, in our pickup truck talking about, like, maybe we should find a church. And so, like, we, we both, like, we both believed, but again, it wasn't a saving faith at that point. But I think it was the seed of need was there. Like, we, we, we recognized the hole that was there. But we never did anything about it. And it was really as I started to grow and understand my role as somewhat of his steward, uh, you know, his, his guardian in a way. Um, of making sure that he got the word. And um, I I definitely could have done a much better job of, of being more consistent with it, but um, I would make sure to um, to basically preach the gospel to him. And a lot, a lot of times what I would do is on Sunday um, after church, I would go directly there and I would read the sermon text in kind of a overview of the sermon, basically. And there was even a time where I asked my pastor, like, hey, can I get your notes? Um, And so he would let me just after after church, I would just go over, you know, he would set his notes down and his Bible down on the chair as he's talking to people. And I would just go grab his notes and go photocopy them. Because he would make like handwritten notes and everything to the printed one. So even if he printed a second copy, it wouldn't exactly be what he talked about. So because he would make edits and everything. So I would just go do that. And then I would have that to do. So that was kind of a cool thing. Um, but then also we had some really faithful people too um, in in my church that that kind of took on the a disciple role, a discipleship role. And both to me and, and to Sam. And so we had two gentlemen uh, in general, one, one of whom has since become one of our pastors. And they came, each of them came once a week. Wow. So we had two wow. these visits, you know, every week. And, um, you know, sometimes it was more of a social visit. There would always be uh, prayer, at least, at the end. Um, but a lot of times we would, you know, they would have something in particular that they would want to read or discussion that they would want to have. And our main kind of goal was always to just kind of drive the gospel home to him. Anything that we read to him which, I mean, this should happen in your church. Um, anything, any part of the Bible that's read, the gospel should be tied to that, I hope. But that was really the thing that we wanted to nail in him is understanding the, the need for Jesus. How do you do that when he doesn't have short-term memory? I mean, how does that, what happened? So repetition was really, was really key. Okay. Um, there was, we were, we did this catechism class where there was a specific catechism where we were, that we were learning. I didn't end up keeping up with it, but there was like the short answer version for like the kids basically, and then the longer answer. And so we just kind of took the short answer version (laughs) and we just did the first like few. And so the very first question is, um, what is our only hope in life and death? And the short version, version answer is that Let's see, where's our only hope in life? Our only hope in life and death is that now I can't remember it. Sam remembered it. <laughs> What's the thrust I, of it? I can't remember, but basically that, that, that God that, that God is the author of life and death and that, that, that Jesus is our savior. And so Sam could recite that. So I would I would uh 
It's called a closed sentence. Okay. So I would start it off, and he would basically fill in the blank. So you're using your degree. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so we would we would use that. And then there were certain verses, too, that we would try, you know, to, to do. And then I would do that same thing. I would start it off and have him fill in the blank. And just through repetition and, you know, it was all around the same theme. Sure. Um, and all, it all made sense. And then we just have conversations about it, too. Um, he definitely had a harder time just kind of blindly accepting things. Oh, he did? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and, some, and he could definitely be kind of uh, angry sometimes about certain things. Um, if, he was in a, if he was in a mood... Uh-huh, you know, uh-huh. then then maybe, you know, he wasn't so apt to accept something, um, what, whatever that may be, than he was at other times. And, you know, but I would ask him, you know, if you believed, I would ask him, you know, I, I would ask him these questions kind of trying to figure out, does he really believe or is he just telling me what he thinks I want to hear? That would be, that would be something that you'd want to know. Yeah. And... Even the times when, you know, it was challenging and, you know, he was upset about something or whatever, um, you know, I basically only got answers to the affirmative as far as his faith. Um, well, what would he say? You know, I would ask him, I would ask him, you know, you know, he was your savior and you would say Jesus. You know, ask him who, you know, who do we have to be, who do we have to thank for this? And he'd say the Lord. Um, uh, he, there were certainly things that I could tell that were remnants of his childhood. Uh Just even, even like, even though, even the way he would say the Lord, like he would, he would usually refer to God as the Lord. And I don't think that was really something that verbiage that I typically use. And so I think that must have been what he grew up with. Yes. Um, and he, we would, uh, when, when our pastor and our friend Dan would come to pray, uh, you know, we would always ask him for what his prayer request is. And it was usually something, uh, something about me, protecting me, keeping me safe, keeping me healthy, something like that. Every now and then he would have something more to say. And like one of the ones that he said was that God would remove this fog from his brain. Oh my. Oh my. That. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, actually, it wasn't fog that he said. It was some other word, but it meant it basically meant fog. Um, but yeah, so that was kind of a a big one. Um, but you could see that the faith was there. Yeah. And our, our, our pastor and, and, and the other gentleman that, that came, they both felt really confident in his belief, in his, in his salvation. I think it's incredible that his faith was really grown and nurtured during this period in his life. Mm-hmm. So you were using your speech therapy work, uh, Actively with your husband. Yeah. Did you ever have plans to work in that field? I did. I I completed my internships, and then I started working uh, in the school district, actually, which wasn't really I, – I, adult rehab was what I was more interested in. But just based on just the timing of things and the logistics and everything, at least for what's called my clinical fellowship year – it was just kind of easier <laughs> to go with the school, but I, I wasn't at a traditional school. I was at a center for kids with um, significant special needs that they needed, they were actually on their own campus. And there there were no general ed. There was no general ed population, um, so it was in a school entirely of special day classes. So we had kind of two main groups. We had um, orthopedically and intellectually disabled kids, many of whom were also medically fragile. And then we had middle school and high school kids on the spectrum whose autism affected them significantly enough that they needed to be on at that campus. Um, and so it was quite 
diverse group uh, group there. But even though I was working, you know, I was I was off basically at three. There's still reports to write. There's th- there's a ton of work that doesn't get done during the day because all Absolutely. all the administrative stuff that has to happen can't happen when I'm doing therapy. Yeah, no. And it can't happen when I'm sitting in the IEP meeting that lasts for three hours. Um, And so there was a lot of work to be done in the evenings and over the weekends. And then I was missing the best part of the day with Sam. So his kind of best part of the day was between like 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. And that was when his therapy was, which was like my favorite part of the day too. And... Um, he typically, they would put him back to bed. He wouldn't go to sleep usually, but they would put him back to bed at around 4, which was usually, I would get there 4, 4.30. And at that time, I wasn't going every day either because I had I had a lot of work to do too. So there was um, a good amount of time where I was probably only there, you know, three to four days a week. And I kind of had to lose my Saturdays because it was like, all right, I've got all this work to do. I need to see him. And the, I felt really pulled in a lot of different yeah, directions. Yeah, sounds like it. So I ended up starting my second year, and um, we Sam ended up having needing uh, an abdominal surgery. It first went well, and then ended with so many complications. He ended up in the ICU at the Mather VA, our local VA hospital, for a month. Almost died multiple times, and then um, including like a middle of the night trip to the to the OR. Um, uh, and so, what started off as me taking like two days of PTO, like Friday and Monday, turned into having to take family medical leave, and then oh, which boy. basically took me to the end of the school year, and then I he was likely going to have to have another surgery to basically like replumb his entire GI tract um, in August, which would have been when I went back to work. And so between just already feeling guilty, mm-hmm. having to work as much as I did and, and not being with him in the way that I wanted to, and then this surgery and everything just like looming, and the fact that I didn't have to work either. Right. Um I, it was, it ended up being a really easy decision, actually. Um, and so I resigned in like May. And um, so, you know, my, my boss was able to have plenty of time to hire somebody. And I didn't have to have that stress just looming over me. And I could just focus on him. And I knew that I was never going to wish that I worked more or that I was further along in my career than I was. I w- would always wish for more time with him. Amen. And that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And so I had I had that. Can we continue this? Absolutely.